Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with I, your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 516. That's 516 of the Agassino Zynga show. Wherever you're meeting this, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're doing fine. It's I, your host Agassino Zynga. If you're tuning into this via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen to it via the podcasting app, specifically, specifically, specifically the Apple podcast, please leave me a five-star review, four-star review, three-star review, two-star review, one-star review, any star. I don't care. Let people know that you're enjoying the show or you're not enjoying the show via the review section on there. It'll take you two minutes to do the review. It really helps to get this, the, the podcast obviously seen by a lot of people and push up the algorithm and people are entering on my name. So it also feels people be like, oh yeah, shit, people actually listen to the show. So if you could do that, I'll be greatly appreciated. I've already seen a ton on there already. So thank you so much. If you've already done it, please ignore what I have to say now. And of course, support for your patrons is also welcome, more than welcomed. Whilst you're listening to this, there should be an uploaded um, episode on Patreon for my Patreon subscribers only, detailing some of my more X rated escapades in Berlin, talking about some of the stuff that I consumed, some of the stuff that I saw, and all that good stuff. So if you want to see that, definitely check that out. It's going to be available right now on patreon.com for just Agostino. Register for only one dollar. You can know one dollar, you get access to all that content. So make sure you jump on there. Don't delay. Um, don't delay. Yeah, don't delay. Don't delay. Don't delay. Don't delay. Jump on there today. But yeah, I hope you are well wherever this is may be meeting you. We are here back again, you know, as per usual with me when there's a uh, content breaks, I then come back and hit you over the head again and again and again and again and again. So please bear with me whilst I just steamroll through bits of content and stuff I've been thinking about, of course, during my time away taking a break you know i went to berlin obviously as i mentioned in another podcast over the weekend which was pretty great went there on thursday landed back in london on monday um i'm never gonna do that holiday i'm never gonna do that timetable again or that trip again in the way that i did it in terms of the timings um so for instance i left london at six in the morning or the, the sorry the flight left at six something 6 50 or whatever it may be and then i left berlin at the same sort of time the problem with those kind of flights is that on paper they're pretty good because the idea is that you're going to land there and you're going to have the whole day to do stuff so it kind of maximizes your holidaying time but what, what ends up happening especially for me i'm not sure for you guys i'm a procrastinator i take too long to do many many things so i don't usually pack ahead of time and i'm usually packing until the very last moment like right? changing outfits figuring out this i need this i need that i need that and then when you get there you, ha- you don't even use half the shit you brought with you typical typical shit so I did all that stuff, which ended up making me, you know, stay up until like 1 a.m. or something the night, the, the morning of. So I couldn't get to sleep because I was nervous about missing my flight because that's the one fright I had in my. The one thing that always kind of. What, what's another fear that I have? Hmm. What's another fear? Yeah, a fear that I have. Maybe getting caught shoplifting something really cheap, innocuous, like a Kinder Bueno or something, right? That's one of my big fears in life, right? It's be- being held up in front of a flipping till and everyone seeing that you clearly stole something and happened to be something really minute, like a flipping Muller Corner or something, right? That's super embarrassing and super something I'm really afraid of. And then the other thing I'm really afraid of is missing my flight, especially a shitty Ryanair flight and then having to pay like, you know, double the price to get somewhere or just having to kind of compete completely bin the holiday because you don't want to waste too much money on it those are two things that you know really scare me so whenever it comes to flights i'm always kind of super ahead of time i don't try and get there just in time i always try and get there two hours or three hours ahead it doesn't matter i'd rather chill there and listen to my music or read my book than be at home you know threatening fretting if i'm going to get there in time or in some cases what i've done now especially now that i have a little bit more kind of disposable income i'll usually just get an Air, an uber there so sorry yeah an uber or a cab there so that'll mean that i know that i'm going to get there at a specific time they may be on the way back because I don't, i'm not really in a rush i can kind of get back on you know the train or the bus or whatnot so anyway that early time leaving the flight well the the, the flight early and i'll see the flight back early you're obviously thinking about it, leaving, leaving, you got a whole day, coming back, you got a whole day. But obviously, because I didn't stay, because I didn't sleep ahead of time and I stayed up because I was nervous, I ended up not sleeping at all. So by the time I landed in Berlin, which might have been what, 10 a.m. or something, I was completely shattered. But then where I went to go stay, because like an idiot, I booked my flights. No. Yeah, like an idiot, I booked my flights, but then I booked my Airbnb second, which is, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing. I don't know which way you could do it, but regardless, I fucked up. So what I ended up doing is I ended up 
booking my flights from Thursday. No, I booked my flights from Thursday to Monday, but I booked my Airbnb stay from Friday to Monday. And then when I went back to try and get that other Friday in the same spot, it already been taken. Somebody already had taken that one day. So I had to look for an apartment or somewhere to sleep for that one night. And I was like, you know what? Should I go and make the hassle of having to go to someone's house and do all that nonsense? I couldn't bother. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to go to a hotel because it's going to be the same as going to a hostel because it's still going to be 4 p.m. check-in. So I thought, you know what? Fuck it. Let me just go to a hostel and just see what the vibe is like in Berlin, like hostel vibes. It might be quite fun. I might bump into a good crew because I still have this kind of like... um. I still have these kind of fond, great memories of going to a hostel in Nicaragua, right? That was my first kind of big holiday on my own, um, quote unquote. Um, I went to go visit an old friend there who had been doing, um, I think, some charity work, if I'm not mistaken, for a company out there in Nicaragua or something. Because, again, she could speak Spanish, even though she's a British girl, which was quite cool. Or So even though she's an English girl, let's say that. But she was obviously living over there for a period of time, like a year or something, maybe, I think. And I went to go visit her during that time and obviously go spend some time in the country as well. Um, I spent a lot of time on my own, actually, in Leon, which was pretty good. She kind of forced me to kind of do that, which was nice. So I got time to travel. So that was really, really awesome. Yeah, that was really great. I have to give that girl credit for that, man. Like, I, was, I went under the guise of seeing her for two weeks. But then the second week, she kind of just sent me on my way just to go to Leon and stuff. And I got to hang out, practice my Spanish and just fucking fall around. And I got to meet a pretty sick crew of people in that Nicaragua hostel some of which I'm still friends with on Facebook to this day do you know what I mean not on Facebook oh, I deleted my Facebook didn't I my original one but it doesn't matter anyway I was, still, I was still friends with them on social media for a very long time and anyway good times um, but I've, I have fond memories of fond memories of hostels mostly based on that which is obviously a bad memory to base your hostel experiences on because that was the one kind of defining holiday sort of moment it's sort of like basing all your lads holidays on the one you went with your lads when you were 18 it's never going to be the same again Jeremy because that was a specific time in your life when you're all going through the same sort of thing new experiences just not going to be the same I know same thing's going to be happening in New York I went to New York when I was and that was my first big lads holiday when we were like 18 19 it was a group of like 10 of us or 15 of us I think we stayed in this fucking hostel it doesn't really exist anymore we went to great restaurants we hung out in bars we drank 40s we did some sick stuff in it and I'm sure when I go back it's not going to be the same but I went anyway to Berlin and I thought let me just stay in this hostel for one night just to see what the vibe is like just to kind of gather gather the gather the vibe and see if I can find a good crew to kind of hang out with on that first night got there obviously I couldn't check in until 4pm I had too many bags with me I couldn't really go out and have fun because I just do, I felt like I smelt I don't know about you guys but when, I, when I'm on a, when I'm playing when I get off a plane the first thing I want to do is just shower and change into some like nice clothes and kind of go out and have a wonder I don't want to stay in those airport clothes I kind of wear those airport clothes because they're airport clothes um, I want to get out of it as soon as possible I had some sweatpants on and a hoodie and shit I just wanted to just you know wash and I couldn't because we didn't have anything um, that was a that was obviously a bit of a par and then and I was just super tired because I was obviously up for fucking 24 hours um, and yeah I'm never doing that again and obviously on the way back because I, I left the club really late on a Sunday night and then I couldn't really sleep because I had to be up at 6 a.m. So it's a foreign city. So I'm even more worried about getting to the airport on time. So I'm never doing that again. If anything, I'm going to do the arriving normal time. Like it's, let's say, you know, a leaving, sorry, um, you know, sometime after maybe 12 p.m. or something flight, which is a different one, different airline. I prefer to go to EasyJet instead of taking a ride from Stansted. And then coming back, I'll also do a flight that kind of leaves after 10 a.m. or something. Um, because it's one thing coming back home, maybe you're with the whole day to spare because maybe your holiday mood for gone but leaving that early in the morning is just not a vibe so that's definitely something i've kind of noted that i'm not going to do going forward i'm probably i'm going to do it because i keep saying it and i always repeat the same mistakes it's like but it is what it is i'm going to try my best not to make the same mistake then um another thing that's interesting i found out about berlin or something i've experienced over the last couple of times i've been there and it's something that's very unique to that city because it doesn't it doesn't necessarily happen here in london i don't really feel it maybe because i'm again i have a my perspective on it isn't the most um what you call it detached because obviously i lived here and shit but for the most part i find it very interesting when you go out in berlin especially big techno clubs especially just in the scene in general there is a lot of frostiness or a little bit of static that exists between fellow black people that live in berlin like fellow people in the scene fellow people kind of making their way around right creatives artists djs scene people whatever it may be there's always a bit of static i don't know why it is and i think um maybe a lot of it has to do with like that kind of idea of like you know 
you want to be the cool quirk you want to be the cool quirky black kid in your little scene so when somebody else comes along that's also equally as cool and quirky as you are you kind of feel a bit uncomfortable right like as if they're going to come and take your spot because you fought so hard to have it so that could be one thing or it could just be the sense of just like i don't know black people in general we're not the most how would I say? When it comes to us, when it comes to our own people, we're not the most kind of gregarious and open armed. Nowadays we are because this whole like, you know, this fake kind of, um, no, it's not fake, but there is this kind of over, um, I call over emphasis, but there is this kind of concentrated effort that exists now at the moment where people are trying to promote people within their own communities right especially black people they're trying to kind of lift up people that are doing good things but for the most part it is pretty difficult to get people from your own community to give you props on certain things you're doing sometimes you have to kind of go out from outside your community in order to kind of get the respect you want from your own community it happens in all different kind of you know gender so it all happens in all different cultures colors and creeds i'm sure it does but for some reason it does happen a lot in the black culture because anyway anyone can attest to this anyone who's been to a caribbean or african nigerian Ghanaian restaurant you know and you don't know the people you know how they get you know how you get treated i mean it's not the same when a white person walks in right they lay down the fucking white carpet i mean hello oh my god you know what i mean they want to give them the whole experience it's in the man but you go in there and ask some ask auntie for a particular hairstyle or a particular meal you know what i mean you have to fight some battles you have to go there a few times to get her respect you know what i mean and even then she might not even smile at you it might just be like okay to whatever so well, it is what it is but i did notice that i did notice a real weird static that exists between other black people that you kind of bump into especially when i went to Bergheim. i noticed a bit when i was in palomas i noticed a bit when i went to um what is what i went to oh, i went to roses for a bit i could bump into a couple of people there i noticed that a tiny bit when i was in the same heads but for the most part it definitely was a thing i noticed in Bergheim for sure i don't know why it was man like you just saw a bit of static like and again i'm i'm a quite friendly dude as you can you know from my personality on the podcast i'm quite an outgoing guy i would say i'm an you know extrovert introvert like i like to go places on my own right i traveled to berlin for basically five days or for however long that was and basically spent a lot of the time on my own when i wasn't in clubs so i like spending time on my own but also like to you know meet new people share new experiences you know a couple of key couple of key bumps in the toilets i'm all game for all that sort of stuff right but I did notice that, you know, whenever you did bump into somebody who looked like you, it always felt a bit weird. It always felt a bit static. And again, I'm a friendly guy, but if you give me static and you give me the cold shoulder, I'll give you, you know, I'm from ends and it is what it is. I'm not going to lick your ass. So I'll give you the cold shoulder too, which is a shame because I want to get to know you. You look cool. You look interesting. You're obviously in this place. So that obviously means that you're got a cool and interesting you know taste palette whatever it may be right you're into cool and interesting things we could probably be friends right it's, there is a lot of kind of missed opportunities there right a lot of kind of misconnections right remember that shit back in Craig, was it craigless days or country I forgot when i was whatever it may be there are some misconnections there in that, res that respect but also a part of me maybe it's the matured part of me because when i was younger that might have been like you know fuck them all but the mature part of me would say i understand the frostiness and the kind of static that exists because if you and if you kind of look at the scene or the city that they're in and the battles that you have to fight if you are somebody that is non-white in that sort of city i'd imagine especially kind of navigating even the dance music scene over there it must be difficult you know i'm not saying it's any more difficult than any other place in the world but i would imagine trying to make it in entertainment over there in any kind of way is not the easiest there's probably not enough spaces for people in general overall forget your color gender sexuality and creed whatnot there's probably just not enough opportunity for people then there's of course there's gatekeeping involved and there's all this kind of weird politicking involved then there's people just bad man bad mining people i mean there's loads of shit involved so i can understand when people can get a bit protective and a little bit more tense when they see somebody else coming who maybe could be a threat to their position i kind of get it and if you worked really hard to kind of get any kind of footfall any kind of foothold the last thing you want to do is, is have someone like me come along with my ha ha he he and you know try and slip in there and try and be that guy which obviously i'm not trying to be that guy because i think i do kind of pride myself on knowing how to play my position in places i kind of pride myself on being a really good house party guest in terms of like i know when to leave right because that's always kind of a skill in parties knowing when especially when it comes to house parties there is a time when it kind of approaches a weird time and you think you can stay for an afters but really what they want is you to leave so they can kind of relax and enjoy their own home so you have to know when to leave and be a good guest so you know good guest bring a drink 
good guests also know when to leave in the right time but I'm also kind of proud of myself in the idea that when I'm in a conversation with people and I'm in a space with people I do I don't always even though I can have a tendency to do so I try to make sure I keep myself in check when it comes to like not allowing my personality to take over the room you know I mean I let other people breathe because that's one thing you know I've kind of known that I've kind of done in other times in my life where I've kind of tried to overtake the room and be too overpowering and so they can kind of suffocate people so it's good to kind of let other people shine because they let other people shine it also makes a room much more fun and other people have more fun too apart it's like the kind of idea of like you know what I said about the guy in the house party after Paloma's he made he killed the entire sort of like afters because he didn't want to let go control of the flipping you know youtube right and the music that i was playing he just went to play his stuff and show us his his mixes that he was into and whatnot he didn't want to let anybody else play anything you think he let a girl play one tune and of course she's a girl so he went to kind of probably fuck her that's probably why he let her actually touch the laptop but apart from that he was kind of you know really really hands-on with it and obviously that killed the entire mood of it and that's kind of the tiny things you kind of grow up with and you figure out when you're in life blah 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 but anyway yeah I, I noticed that i don't know if it's something that again maybe i'm projecting so again if you're in berlin and you're black let me know in the comments um is that a thing do you feel a little bit static with people that you bump into especially for the first time i guess it's different when you bump into them many times i think most of the time if you if i you know from even in london it's the same sort of thing there is sometimes a bit of static but if you see someone two or three times you give them a, a couple head nods you might say safe what's up i mean you'll get to know each other sooner rather than later but it did feel weirdly tenser than i've ever felt in any kind of scene when i went to berlin so again if you're there and you live there let me know in the comments is that thing there why is that um is it just because there's you know crabs in the barrel sort of mentality that exists over in berlin is it a kind of consequence of the competitive nature of the scene overall um is it just the way you guys are built over there it's just a different vibe you're not just you know ha he he as much as we are over here in london i don't know let me know in the comments down below i'd be so 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 curious to find out what you guys think and what your position is on that one i really would um next on the list we have this interesting thing, right? The development regarding the Kyle Rittenhouse case. And I think I spoke about this on my podcast a while ago. Um, and at the time, if I'm not mistaken, I made I might, I might have made like two videos or three videos back to back. And if you if you remember at the time, I think when I did make those videos or I did make those clips, no, when I did speak about it on the podcast, obviously I clipped it and put it on my channel. Um, at the time, the information I had made it seem as if this car written house kid i think again to just give you some background this kind of happened during the whole like um george floyd sort of um you know fallout i think it was it before george floyd anyway there was a lot of racial tension happening in the united states during that time and if i'm not mistaken this might have been the jacob blake thing when the dude was in the car the black dude was in his car he got told to um put his hands down something he went back to reach into his car and then the cops shot him from the back and now he's paralyzed remember that dude right and i think that kind of led to more riots happening in all parts of america and obviously people were burning down businesses and she's just doing some really mad mad stuff in it and then i guess in the during all this turmoil this car written house kid 17 at the time um went to this place where this process was taken and basically went under the guise of trying to protect big local businesses and also to help clean up graffiti you know whilst carrying a gun because he wanted to keep himself safe or whatever who knows the details of that sort of thing but the most important thing what the media tried to portray was that he was basically going around shooting people right he was basically like a mass murderer sort of vibe. i thought they were kind of spinning it as like protesters were kind of going at him and he was kind of just basically shooting them at will and obviously when the first bits of footage come out it did kind of seem that way and the way they were painting him and just the media narrative around it i kind of you know i like to think of myself as a smart guy but even i got kind of drawn into the way the media was spinning it and making him seem like a i don't know like a social like a psychopath or something it was just flipping insane but then as you started to see more bits of evidence i'd see more video and clips and whatnot because those people were flipping live streaming the protests as they were going on what you end up seeing was a kid that was a def essentially defending himself um from a mob who essentially did want to kill him because a few of them did have guns a few of them did have you know weapons like a skateboard and shit that could have easily knocked him out and whatnot caused really severe injuries and he was effectively trying to defend himself and unfortunately in the pursuit of defending himself he had to kill two people right along the way and i think that's just is the 
you know, I guess it's the unfortunate consequences of living in a country where people are allowed to carry guns if you can defend yourself then the unfortunate reality of it is somebody might die I don't I just don't know why some people are not realizing that I think it's the same case with COVID it seems like some people have got in their head with COVID that we want to get to a point where no one dies anymore it's like that's never going to happen we're going to limit the numbers so it doesn't it doesn't get exponentially worse and it's not going to be a strain on our medical services but there's never going to be a period of time when there's going to be no deaths whatsoever if this is as serious as people think it is there's going to be some people who unfortunately are going to be just be unlucky in terms of their genes or whatnot or their past medical history where they're just not going to be able to survive getting COVID. So I think people have kind of had the same thinking. I mean, for some reason, they think this kid carrying a gun isn't meant to use it if somebody is chasing him and trying to beat him up or hurt him or you know, basically kill him or what, what, or whatever it may be, especially when he's on his own. It just didn't make any sense. So the video comes out, the other evidence, and it's basically clear now, especially when the court case, because he's in court now, that's why the headline courtesy of the BBC it says here, Carl Rittenhouse accused teen takes a stand in his own defense. We'll quickly read this before I continue. It says, US teenager charged um, with the shooting of three people during a civil unrest in the States, uh, streets of a concert last year has taken to a stand a uh, prosecutor say mr rittenhouse 18 was looking for trouble last night sorry that night the teen has pleaded not guilty to all charges against him but the entire case was thrown into jeopardy on wednesday when the defense called a material sorry mistrial after the judge angrily accused the prosecution of improper questions for the defendant mr rittenhouse facing counts of reckless intention um attempted homicide as after he shot two men dead and wounded in love in the city of kenosha uh, right. I think the one he wounded dead was the one he shot in the bicep, the one on the skateboard. He's, he's, I remember the video, his wrists were limp completely. It's like, if I'm not mistaken, I think he blew out the majority of his bicep. He probably doesn't have anything there. It's probably all gone. Um, but again, it was a fucking mad shot because I think he was on his back. You think he shoots one guy in the chest and then the other guy shoots in the arm. Like the kids are fucking marksmen. It's a right as I erupted in the streets of the city two days earlier after the police shot a black man, Jesse, Jacob Blake. Uh, Mr. Rittenhouse had traveled to the city from his home in Illinois with a cemetery rifle in tow. He said he sought to help protect property from the rest of the streets. And obviously, there was the other business people who said they didn't ask him to do so and he kind of went out of, out of his own volition. So, um, da, 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 da. oh, so let's just sit here. Can take a standing risky move for defendant in middle trial. Mr. Ryan said, I didn't do anything wrong, I, did, I defended myself. Describing scenes of the chaos and injury, he said that he had heard people shout to get him. Videos and showed a gun toting teen shouting, friendly, friendly, friendly to the crowd. The person that attacked me first threatened to kill me, he said. Um, um, said uh, he said of Joseph R Rosenbaum, who people aren't really saying out loud, but this guy is basically, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, he's a registered pedophile, right. He's the one that legitimately raped kids and he got, I think, he, I don't know why he was out, but he was out for whatever reason, maybe he served his time. And he's the one also, the, the little ginger, I think he's also the same good dude that said the N-word when he's kind of um, trying to get out this car written as a kid when they're outside somewhere, I'm pretty sure. So he's not the, you know, again, not the person that you should be kind of, you know, um, trying to fight for in that regard. But hey, we move forward. He said he told the jury that he believed Mr. Rosenbaum was carrying a chain with him at one point, uh, though he later learned it was a plastic bag. Um, I think he had a plastic bag with a painting or something. He had something he was trying to hit the kid with, innit? That might have been the one that was excessive. He goes to hit him with a bag, a plastic bag, and the kid shoots him in the face or in the chest twice. It's like, boom. The judge called for a break after many recent person to tears after he began to describe the jury members before the fatal shooting. His mother also was seen sobbing in the gallery. Upon his return to the stand, the teen said he had nowhere to run at the time. I didn't intend to kill. I tend to stop the person who was trying to kill me and trying to steal my gun. Mr. Rittenhouse said he shot and killed Mr. Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum had laid a hand on his rifle. A video from the scene shows the teen fought to the ground as he was chased. And Mr. Rose Rittenhouse said he led to fear even more. The they identified Mr. Hover, the second person who shot hit him with a skateboard of course yeah that that's a kid that's also bait i think this skateboard kid be, hits him with a skateboard hits him with a skateboard over the head then just to grab his gun then as they're in tussling then obviously he shoots the guy and obviously he goes down he said mr gage gross this gross this bicep dude um said he wounded him in the arm he had approached him with his pistol point in his head and then i think he did a, he tried to do a slight thing as all well, the third guy where he tried to put his hands up and then tried to go for the gun again and obviously written house for whatever reason this guy must walk flip him be a you know call of duty guy because he immediately saw the flinch and then kind of shot the kid straight away in his arm da -da -da. So, in conclusion, with this case, it's another case, again, of the media spinning stuff in a way to kind of um, get the public all riled up, to also get the public to essentially crucify somebody who quite clearly was defending themselves. But in the grand scheme of things, this dude is a, you know, he's, a, he's, he's the biggest dork that, you know, that ever has, I've ever seen. This is a, 
I say this level of dorkness, if you're 17 or 18, is similar to like kids who are really into politics, right? Go into a state you don't live in or a place you don't live in. Again, it doesn't matter what, if you cross state lines or not, Chris, I don't care about that detail. But he doesn't live in that area. He went and traveled there, um, supposedly because he works there, supposedly to clean up graffiti, whatever it may be. is a real dork move, right? This idea that he went out there to be a kind of, a, what, a peace cop, um, to police the neighborhood, to help businesses that had, hadn't asked for his help, that he has no personal connection to whatsoever, was so lame. Again, the height of darkness. It's like 17, 18 year olds doing political debates and shit and going to climate change rallies. You know what I mean? You're 17 and 18, you should be getting your dick wet. You should be out there getting drunk, taking loads of drugs, falling around. Like, why? what are you doing taking part in flipping protests like this? Like, what, what are you doing? Really, what are you doing? Complete loser in that respect. Um, you know, doesn't need to be said and now of, of course off the back of this he's going to turn into some sort of right-wing hero right he's going to be on all the shows that you heard of because everyone on my social media feed who's basically praising him and talking about how innocent he is is obviously a right-wing nut not right-wing nut but you know those right-wing sort of like media grifters and then on the other side of people who are saying that he should be in jail and he's crocodile tearing are the ones who are on the left who have no concept of actual what reality is actually like right because these people legitimately think he should just let the mob beat him up potentially kill him potentially fatally you know injure him in a way or you know injure him to in a really bad way just because he had an he had a bigger gun than they did it doesn't make any sense the whole point of carrying a gun in the first place is to protect yourself if somebody does come within a you know a space where they can maybe cause you bodily or harm unfortunately the consequences are going to be grave the other person's got a gun that's just the kind of the reality you accept living in America and it? it just is what it is that's why most people would sense probably don't want to live, live there full time because if you get into an altercation it could be fatal right it could be fatal it could be deadly right to some extent so that is basically what ended up happening and of course um, you know, unfortunate event I think the first dude that died again no one's going to cry any tears if you raped kids could give a shit could, kick, could, could care less really the second guy with a skateboard, I think, got engaged or married recently or something like that. So it was sad to see his girlfriend. I think at the time, if I remember, his girlfriend or someone was sobbing on TV. That was bad to see. But again, why would you go hit somebody with a skateboard who's got a gun when you don't have anything? Dumb move. Um, the guy with the the guy that got shot in a bicep. Again, he tried to play a funny game and said, you know, I'm not going to do anything. Put his hands up and he tried to pull for his gun. You know, he tried to play the game. He got burnt. It is what it is. Um but again, like I said, the kids are dork. You know, there's nothing dissimilar to people like this than the kids that go to climate change rallies when you're that age. You should be trying to get a dick wet. You should be listening to loud music, driving around, you know, fooling around, getting arrested for shit. You know, for actual, like, you know, young people shit, like putting on house parties and stuff, whatnot, in elite, in Airbnbs. You shouldn't be going out there trying to be the, I don't know, the protector of small businesses in your neighborhood at that age. It's just... It's just the most lamest thing I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, these kids on the internet, they just grow up too quick. They're either, so, they're either super politically engaged or they're super, super advanced when it comes to, you know, sex and relationships and stuff, right? They're talking about my man, my this, my, my boo, my bass. Like, ugh, mate, honestly, just get blackout drunk, smoke a bunch of weed, do a bunch of coke and just, you know, live your life that way as opposed to fucking you know, going around with your semi-automatic weapon trying to, what, police a rowdy bunch of people. Because, you know, you put yourself, again, there's an element of, like, purposely putting yourself in the line of fire. Then when it blows up, trying to cry a foul, I understand. But the way the media spun this to make this guy seem like he was a flipping school shooter was disgusting, to say the least. And I kind of got drawn into it. So more likely than not, he's going to get acquitted. More likely than not, he's going to be found not guilty on all charges, especially because, you know, certain people have kind of changed their testimony or whatnot it's definitely going to go that way and just the idea the, the premise he was key he was kind of put in the stand for is definitely not what the evidence has shown and some people still can't get their head around their head wrapped around it he was clearly defending himself there's kind of evidence even being shown in some, in some cases i forgot which one it was but there was one case where it looked like he got actually shot at first and then he kind of you know replied back with his own fire but because he's obviously an expert marksman um his ability to kind of spin around in a dime and shoot somebody you know his ability to do it from his back and shit like you know the guy's fucking a beast when it comes to that sort of stuff there was people who were basically unlucky 
um, they kind of had, had to come across a kid who clearly has been practicing with his rifle and his weapon for a very long time. Again, unfortunate events. Not going to cry for the first dude. Second dude, don't attack somebody with a skateboard who's got a gun, but again, RIP. And then the third dude lost the, the, the function of most of his right arm. Kenny Wank, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? We move on. Um, what else are we going to talk about here? Because we have to move. Oh, we've got news here courtesy of Hype Beast that Supreme have opened up a new flagship store in, guess what? One of my favorite cities in the world, Berlin. Um, it happened just after I left, actually. I think they even did a screening for a new, what's his name? Um, the guy that films all the videos for fucking Supreme. Is it William St Strobeck? Whatever he, however you pronounce his fucking name. The guy that looks like he doesn't shower and shit. So th that dude obviously filmed a new um, video for Supreme. He premiered it somewhere. I guess it looks like it might be Soho House in Berlin. Um, somewhere over there. Um, loads of cool kids are there. Hanging around, falling around, doing the damn thing. It's a Supreme store in Berlin. I think a lot of people kind of guessed it. I think I might have guessed it too in one of my older videos if I look back and say... Um, mostly because of the investment that Supreme got, right? And the fact that that, that investment firm didn't invest in Supreme just to keep it the way it was. There's obviously going to be some changes, maybe not operation, not operation, that is operational, maybe not in terms of design and in the product, but in terms of how they operate as a business and expansion, all that sort of stuff, it was definitely going to be a mark. It was definitely going to be a sign that they were going to ramp up the amount of stores that they had, especially in Europe. And, you know, we've heard there's going to be maybe another store opening up in Italy, I've heard of another store maybe opening up in Amsterdam. Sorry, in Amsterdam, yeah, Holland, Amsterdam, Pacific, specifically too. So there's loads of scope for them to go going forward. But of course, Berlin is an, is a good hub for them to go into. Loads of skaters from there, especially from neighboring countries as well. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of cachet there too. And that may be, because I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure the sensible choice or the sensible kind of conclusion would be that when they open a new store in a new country, that definitely means that they then increase the quantities of stuff that they're making, right? It doesn't mean that you just keep the same quantities and just kind of spread the thing across different stores. I'm pretty sure that means they increase the quantity. So if they increase the quantities, that means there's going to be more likelihood for you to be able to get hold of Supreme items. And I think nowadays, again, even though I don't like... I don't like it because it's not. It doesn't make it as cool as it was for me in the past. And, you know, that that is what it is. I think it's quite unfair to kind of have that kind of... It's not as cool anymore, Supreme thing. Because I think that it does operate, similar to Nike, as like the first sort of entry that you need to have into the scene of streetwear in general, or skatewear, whatever it may be, or skateboarding in general. It adds as it acts as the kind of um entry. Yeah, the kind of yeah, the entry ticket that you need. And then from there you kind of gain your understanding of what's going for. Because I have to be honest, right? So learning about Supreme and skateboarding in general is what kind of informed my taste in music, whether it comes to hip hop, whether it comes to indie whatever it may be right um all that's been informed basically via skate videos and going into the store and hearing certain people and edits and whatnot and clips and going on forums like sidewalk and slap magazine slaps you know forum and shit all those have definitely informed it so that's maybe its role it's always meant to be like that's meant to be a kind of the jumping off point you're meant to kind of go from there and then kind of go into other stuff going forward so maybe at, at this moment in time, it's maybe not the coolest brand for me, but I still kind of respect the that they're still doing that same thing for other kids or other people coming up now, right? They're kind of encountering Supreme for the first time. They're learning about who designed the interior of the store. They're learning about who did the artwork for the for the store itself. They're learning about who's going to be the manager. Because imagine when I was growing up, that was a big thing to find out who was going to be the manager of this new um, Supreme store that opened, right? Who's going to work there? Um, who's going to be on a skate team? Who? All these sort of things are really important. Could you get an invite to the flipping opening party or maybe to the after party in the same night? It's just it's just really, really important sort of shit going forward. Interesting though, I've wondered, it would Berlin being a techno city and obviously Supreme having its roots in hip hop, um, especially in, in New York City, will there be, because we haven't seen it so far, we haven't seen much of Supreme's kind of time in Italy and maybe in France having any sort of inf basically informing maybe the, not the clothes they made but maybe the music that they kind of use and the tones and shit maybe when you go in store it's different but you haven't really seen it too tough we haven't really seen them kind of marrying up or maybe doing a lot of ads or editorial from what i remember with like prominent italian rappers or french rappers and shit maybe there's some that i've completely missed that i don't really know about uh, on more underground but i haven't seen that many um i always thought the italian one 
they could have done something with that guy called Packy, who I'm a big fan of. That could have been pretty sick. Um, he has a, a very supreme s kind of look, right, with his kind of gel down here. Um, but I would like to see if they are going to make that kind of pivot into maybe the dance music space. So you kind of see maybe a few of the kind of music guys rocking up with supreme stuff and whatnot, uh, or maybe they're going to be part of the lookbooks and whatnot going forward. Maybe Kobolsi over there might be. I don't know. I wonder if that's going to be a thing. I wonder. Maybe not. Maybe it's going to be completely different. It's going to stick to what they're doing but that would be pretty sick if that actually ends up happening um but yeah the supreme store on the inside looks pretty sick pretty cool kind of small really for the most part um it's fairly simple layout you know the vibes when it comes to supreme Clash of Hype says Supreme has developed opening of doors of its all new Berlin based flagship store last week. The New York label, which also has a new store in Milan back in May, has confirmed that Germany said yeah, exactly they opened the Milan space only in May. And we are already in fucking, what's it, November, they've got another space in fucking Berlin. That's a pretty rapid um, expansion. And for sure, they're going to have probably two more locations open, or maybe more, because you know how these companies are. They want to double their locations all the time, so maybe be four locations next year. But again, it has to be said for such a big company for such a big for a company that's been around for so long the fact that they still remain something again it's not the coolest brand in the world but it's still got some element of core cool about it is definitely something to kind of give them credit for and to kind of tip their hat to them because they could have easily we've seen many of brands that, you know again i love the guy bobby hundred but bobby hundred is a good example bobby hundreds had a brand in the hundreds that at one point was core. Cool. And it quickly became uncle, you know, because of various different things, but, you know, collaborations, the customer base, where it was sold, expansion, all this sort of shit basically led it to be uncool. Stussy, the same sort of thing. They were really cool for a bit, then they became uncool, then now they're cool again. It's very difficult to keep your level of coolness consistent over the years, especially with the changing nature of the industry, changing customer base, changing things in the world, whatever it may be. So for them to do to do it in some level is really admirable and something that definitely needs to be given a lot more credit than it probably does because a lot of people talk about oh it's not cool it's not cool yeah it's cool it's not it's not meant to be cool to you anymore you're fucking 46 you know what i mean go and get a suit or something you know what i mean it makes simply <laughs> sense but anyway continues just said um comes to the la la the Milan space has confirmed this new germany location will officially open on november the 11th um on the border of Mitte and prince lauerberg the announcement Follows a busy week for the label. Following the, the store is located on the, 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 the Berlin. It will open from eleven um, in the morning to seven thirty on Monday to Saturday, and twelve to six Monday to on Sunday. Sorry. So again, looks fucking fantastic. Love everything about it. Um, congrats to everybody over there at Supreme doing the Lord's work. Next on the list, we've got um, news courtesy of Soul Collector regarding Ami Leon Dior's new Balenciaga 993s, quite possibly, in my opinion, maybe the best ones yet. I know most likely they're going to absolutely rinse this model like they did with the other model, right? They came for a fucking four, maybe eight colorways of that fucking shoe. Um, or was it the 250s? What was it? The 550s, right? The 550s, yeah, whatever they were. Um, so for sure, they're going to flipping, you know, rinse the fuck out of these. But again, don't mind them because because for now looking at them visually this might be my favorite uh, my favorite sort of iteration of the Amelion Dior um, long term sort of collaboration with New Balance because obviously the main guy at Amelion Dior is also now the creative director of New Balance USA if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken so they put together these these two um, colorways for the 993s very ACG-esque inspired I feel like um, the, especially the brown pair they remind me a little bit of my Escape Hirachis that I sold for way too cheap the vintage ones I bought them in like so I bought a, an original pair from like 93 or 96 and I sold them for you know way way less than what they're actually worth but it, that's a story for another day so they've got that kind of feel of it with a black you know solid color midsole same goes for these lighter ones which look more like a lahar sort of um, lava esque acg sort of vibe but you still get that vibe on there um again so two very solid colorways uh i would definitely go for the darker sort of nutty brown color again it reminds me a little bit also of the stray rats new balance that they put together that sort of similar sort of colorway but they look fucking beautiful both both look really good it says here um Coast to text of Soul Collector, um, Amelie and Doors teamed up with New Balance for a series of new collaborations this time around. The partnership focuses on New Balance 993, a model we've seen brewed by brands like Bodega and Joe Fresh Goods in 2021. The two up-and-coming 993s feature staple New Balance um, 
materials like suede overlays and mesh paneling one pair features a brown and green upper while the other primarily uses cream and blue with maroon detailing both pairs utilize a black midsole and outsole drawing from the duos amelion duos is open duh, 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 and runs through the okay the, the, the raffles open right now if you want them but you know Masaki you won't get them anyway so what's the point so I'll just look at the pictures <laughs> but yeah they look fucking beautiful um this brand this brand pair is definitely my favorite with a little bit of greens on them so they're really nice I didn't actually see that was green I thought that was a different sort of color that's actually looks really nice these are gonna wear in really good too with the suede right they're gonna bust up really nice especially if you wear them actually actually wear them and don't try and fucking walk around with duck feet but these look a bloody amazing i'm a big fan of these so big up ami leon dior um is that how you say you pronounce it right ami leon dior i'll i'm in leon ami leon dor or doré i don't know whatever you pronounce it ald new balance 99 freeze definitely check them out definitely check them out because i like the way they look i like the way they look what else are we gonna do today uh Oh yeah, this is a new one. So one of my favorite clubs in London, the Cause, the Cause, unfortunately, has been told it's needed to close um, because I think the property it was on was always basically meant to be redeveloped. But in the interim, they basically gave the club time um, to basically set up shop, you know, run a few programs or whatnot, and then they did it for an extensive period. And of course, over time, they got access to other spaces around the area. Um, you know, through different contexts or whatnot. I think for a short space of time, they had this outdoor space that they, that I don't think is it still around. A little outdoor sort of like um, space they were going to do parties in, but that kind of fell through. I'm not too sure if it did, but whatever. Looks like along those kind of lines. And then, of course, unfortunately, it came to a point when the developers finally gave them a date of when they wanted to start work on the site and need to kind of clear out the club and whatnot. So they kind of gave them a last date. I kind of thought I had went to one of the last parties in November, in October, was it? Was it October? Whenever that was to go to Tricks play for that all night session, but it looks like there's going to be another final date. So this was like the cause is like Sports Direct, right? There's always a flipping date that is that close, but not so close enough to say it's finally over. It's always something else happening around the corner. But anyway, regardless, it's just a joke. It says yeah, the cause has been given a final closing date it's courtesy of Mixmag it says the court the court has confirmed it's closing imminently in an Instagram post earlier today the Tottenham venue had previously announced a series of parties in the run up at the beginning of the end of September and October though no sort of date had been given a number of residential developments have appeared around the venue and they had explained that the tenants moving in soon the current location of the court will not be viable for much longer the court has always planned for that actually relocation to be temporary for home for the project however a new statement today on Instagram it seems that the end could come sooner rather than later with owners announcing they would reveal the final date next week the writings on the wall for our final weekend as she wrote has been made clear we've started a lot of special memories with you over the years so let's make it make sure we end it right uh da -da -da -da. next week we will review our plans for the closing of our current show it wouldn't be right to leave it without one more massive blowout of course it's throwing a series of programs going forward so yeah so we don't really know when the final date is, but I'm guessing the final date is going to be sometime next week. Um, so obviously that is obviously something of a heartbreak for the London club and scene at the moment. But yeah, there is, as much as there is, as much as there are some core cool clubs around, there's not really a real selection of core cool places to go to. It feels like there is only kind of one or two places that are worth really your space or your time to go to. So that's kind of a bit of a shame, but in it. It is what it is, isn't it? They kind of knew what the what the, the the deal was off the back of this. They've kind of built up a solid little community of people who trust their programming, and I think that's major. That's a major, majorly important thing, especially in London, where a lot of people, for the most part, especially in the past, were very driven by the lineups of parties and whether or not you could get the biggest person to play and whatnot. Nowadays, it feels like people are legitimately going to places because of the vibe, because of you know just trusting the crowd, trusting the people that put the nights on to get put the nights together loving the crowd loving the vibe all that sort of stuff is more important than just having the biggest baddest djs playing in certain places which i think is fucking sick so i'm really looking forward to all of that going forward and again they've got a permanent space i think that they've kind of purchased that's next to the cause i'm not mistaken so that obviously will be good for them going forward this we could check out some of these posts what updates they've got here it says this Saturday Adonis should return. Okay, this Saturday is Adonis. So the cause is one of our original residents parties. Sadly, uh, kick off for their first of their final free shows on Ashley Road. Embedding the DNA. Da, da, da. So, yeah, Adonis is happening there very soon. What's this post they got here? What's this about? Da, 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 da. 
for the success there's a free party get involved okay cool doesn't matter but you know how it is, isn't it you know how it is moving on what else do we have here to talk about we talk about berlin store yeah let's talk about this actually quickly talk about this this is courtesy of vogue and this is a weird post because this seems like um, Bella Hadid decided it was a good idea to go on social media and basically talk about her anxiety and whatnot, right? Um, and depression and basically talk about and basically share pictures of herself crying um, uh, via her selfie camera on her phone looking incredibly cute still, which is, you know, something that you have to kind of um, wrangle your head with, right? In her deepest, dark, in her deepest, darkest moments, she still looks hotter than 99% of people out there in the world, right? It's something frustrating, but it is what it is, isn't it? We're all blessed with um, the gift of having flawless looks and whatnot. And a really slender body to fit into sample size clothing, which I'd love to. I'd absolutely love it. But yeah, we, we continue. So this is a courtesy of Vogue. It says, social media is not real. Bella Hadid opens up about her anxiety and depression. And I have some thoughts about this, of course. I have some thoughts. So this is a post courtesy of Instagram. There's a clip here of Willow Smith, I guess, talking about something to do with anxiety and the depression. Um, obviously, Bella Hadid responds to that or it resonates with her in some way. She uploads these pictures of her looking gorgeous, sobbing into her camera, right? Many, many pictures of her crying, which is weird to have pictures of you on your camera roll of you sobbing like this anyway. It's very, very strange. Um, <laughs> well, that's her on an IV drip, right? Is that her getting IV drips or something? I don't know. So it, the caption says the following. That feeling of thinking you're not good enough or being insecure about your art is natural, but some same same time it feels like uh, it feels like it's taught. All humans are different. Every single human has something so special and unique to offer, and people forget that everyone is basically feeling the same way, lost, confused, not really sure why they're here. Um, the anxiety, like everyone else, is feeling that, and trying to cover it up is some in some way. We're gonna come together in our flaws. We're gonna come together in our flaws, in our insecurities, in our joy, in our happiness, and accept it. Uh, it's always beautiful and natural. Again, I don't know, just words that don't make any sense. This is pretty much every day, every night for a few years now. She starts off by saying, social media is not real. For anyone struggling, please remember that. Sometimes all you'll got to hear is that you're not alone. So from time to time, so from me to you, you're not alone. I love you, I see you, and I hear you. <laughs> what? Self-up and mental illness, chemical balance is not linear, and it's almost like a flowing roller coaster of obstacles. It has its ups and downs and side to sides, but I want you to know there's always light at the end of the tunnel, and the roller coaster always comes to a complete stop at some point. There's always room for it to start up again, but for me, it's always been nice to know that even if it's a few days, weeks, or months, it does get better to some extent, even for a moment. It took me a long time to get that in my head, but I've had enough breakdowns and burnouts to know this. If you work hard enough on yourself, spending time alone to understand your traumas, triggers, joys, and routine, you'll always be able to understand and learn more about your pain, how to handle it, which is all you can ask for yourself. Anyways, not sure why, but it feels harder and harder not to share my truth on here. Thank you for seeing me and thank you for listening. I love you. <sighs> what a bunch of bullshit. Oh, you know what, right? This is clearly, again, I, I've said this many a times, but whenever people post many, many, so it's like whenever you go on someone's Instagram page and they have a whole grid full of them just looking into a camera like this, selfie pictures, like, you know, Gerard pk has got an Instagram page that basically is quite famous for him taking weird, awkward kind of boomer selfies of himself, especially when it comes to females, in my opinion, or maybe if it can come to males, but regardless of who it is, in my opinion, it's always been a form of mental illness wanting to take that many pictures of yourself and upload them onto your Instagram feed and just have a cascading grid full of images of yourself staring into the camera at various angles. Usually it's not various angles because we all know our best angles and we usually take the same picture again and again in different guises to show off our best features, whether it's our face, our neck, our lips, whatever it may be, we all have our angles. So they're usually not that different pictures. They, they're usually not that different. They're usually all the same. So you've got all these weird same pictures of yourself, no pictures of friends or places that you go or things that you're in interested whatever it's just all pictures of you that is a form of mental illness secondly people who take pictures of themselves crying into a camera that is also something that's incredibly scary in my opinion to think of somebody who's going through a really destructive um emotionally draining uh mentally debilitating situation and the first thing that they want to do is record themselves crying in that moment that to me is the most bizarrest thing i've ever seen in my life it's like taking a selfie picture of yourself at a funeral of your best friend or something to show people that you're crying at your best friend's funeral like that is how 
moral nuts that is to me it doesn't make any sense whatsoever and then the second part or the third part of it i would say is that this is clearly in my opinion from what i can see especially you know again not knowing anything about these people but i would assume if you're a successful incredibly well known incredibly attractive incredibly rich supermodel there's definitely going to be a point a part of you that feels like the people around you aren't really your real friends they don't really know you too well do they are they really there for you for who you are or are they there for you because of the clout that they can kind of extract from you the rub they can get from standing next to you um the association with you the follows the likes all this sort of stuff that's probably going to be something that's going to be very permanent in your head and the older you get in that industry the more you start to realize that you're not evergreen that there's always a younger hotter tighter looking girl again crass to say but that is a basically the the, the the crux of it when it comes to fashion it's obviously shallow it's obviously superficial there's always somebody else going to come after after you it's going to eventually replace you and your time in the sun will be kind of you know uh, will kind of get washed away in the flipping you know whatever tides of the ocean or whatnot right no one will give a shit about your time so i'm sure that is something that is quite hard to deal with because at the very moment or at that very moment there are parts of you that feel like you are the center of the world right you are basically the living heartbeat of fashion when you walk everyone kind of takes attention right when you're on the runways like oh wow she's back on the runway again wow look at this editorial look at that and it feels like you're the most important person in the world but then you start to think am i the most important person in the world no you're not clearly you're not because you don't have any real friends around you don't have people that actually love you for who you are and again it's very difficult to find them i've always said the hardest thing to find when you're an actual adult not when you're a child when you're an actual adult and you have bills to pay and you actually have a life is friends it's difficult to find friends which is why a lot of people latch on to and hold on to very tightly friends that they kind of encounter in their workspace because you know it's a good place to actually find friends because you're spending eight hours a day with these people especially post pre-pandemic when you're in the office all the time you're maybe going out with drinks to them after work so that's even more time increased so sometimes you're spending more time with people at work than you do with your actual spouse or with your actual partner or whatnot so those are really the greatest times that you can actually meet new friends or maybe from in classes or what da, 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 da. but just imagine how lonely and how kind of isolating it must be to be somebody of notoriety in this in the aspect of a better hadid also or you have to happen to be a very attractive girl which obviously could then isolates you more because i would imagine especially when it comes to girl and girl relationships you are quite limited in the girls you can hang out with because not all girls would want to hang out with you because again you're a supermodel it is what it is um your schedule probably doesn't permit you to have relationships that are just quote-unquote normal because you're all over the world in different places moving around um maybe relationships are pretty hard to deal with you may be able to deal with a specific type of person so all those things i think will contribute to you having anxiety or whatnot feeling bad or whatnot but again most of it's because you don't have any real relationships in your life it's less about the trials and tribulations of the industry you're in because a part of me also thinks to myself like i kind of enjoyed it i kind of liked it when people who were you know who were in very privileged positions just knew that they were privileged. just kind of i wouldn't say I enjoyed it when people in privileged positions didn't try and pretend like they had normal people issues to seem normal. But then it reminds me of this picture of Brooklyn Beckham. Is it Brooklyn Beckham? I think Brooklyn Beckham. He's wearing like a Carhartt jacket with like dickies and some bust up converses right and a white t-shirt tucked in and shit he looks like every other kid that you'd see in maybe whatever hipster city you live in right obviously for me it'd be in london and parts of brick lane shoulders and shit he looks like any other kid that you maybe see maybe working in a bar or just walking around the city trying to grab some lunch or some shit right cool good looking guy and also made me think you know what this kid's a multi-millionaire right his dad's recently signed a deal with some Saudi Arabian group, right? You know, obviously put his morals to one side, but he signed some flipping three digit million dollar deal with that pay people over there. So they're paid for, until the cows go home. He's supposedly some sort of photographer, right? But he's wearing clothes and trying to protrude, portray himself to be this kind of working class, you know, uh, normal looking lad, because for whatever reason, that's in vogue at the moment it's similar to like why i hate padded skateboards right these guys that all go around cosplaying like they're working class wearing sovereign rings and loafers with fucking tracksuit bottoms and shit but they're all from fairly well-to-do um families and backgrounds they're not really from ends in any kind of shape or way they talk with a slight it's all kind of really reductive nonsense stuff but it's not just them everyone sort of does that right they all kind of pretend that they're from ends when they're clearly not 
and they try and portray and kind of you know do this kind of working class cosplay thing because for whatever reason when you're from a privileged background you want to somehow have this kind of like um normalness about you and i guess in some ways either you be normal in terms of the clothes you wear and the people you hang out with or by having some sort of quirky personality or by then you know you know basically acting as if because you're lonely and you have any real friends that you've got anxiety and depression similar to people who really do have some real life issues that they kind of go through and i just i don't know it's, i just find that sort of stuff really 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 disingenuous don't get me wrong you have your issues but don't try and pretend like your issues are anyway anyway similar to what a regular everyday person's going through because they're clearly not and again that's the whole point of having privilege your point of having privilege is that you don't have to go through those kind of problems and if you do maybe they're different kind of problems but they're not the same do you know what I mean that's just the issue i have with it and again i just think it's so weird to taking pictures of yourself crying and having them on your camera roll like why do you why do you have those pictures who are you sending them to and also a part of me is like but I guess as girls anyway, they just have pictures of themselves on their. You go to you go on a girl's. If you ever have a chance to go on a girl's camera roll, it's fucking mad. You go on a guy's camera roll, it's just full of stuff he's downloaded or screenshots or maybe some selfies of his shoes and beers and shit. Go on a girl's camera roll, it's just like mad pictures of themselves, like mad photo shoots that they kind of do on their own. But I also find it hilarious how the girl that was telling us on Complex what sneaker shopping, telling the lads you know, you have to wear a certain thing in order to kind of get a chance to holler at her or whatnot, you know, trying to give the whole bad girl sort of like, you know, homeboy sort of bullshit. It's also the same person that's, you know, taking pictures of herself, crying into her camera. It's like, mate, you know what I mean? Like, come on, give your head a wobble a little bit. But again, beautiful girl. She was great in clothes and shit, but I, I, I did think this was a little bit ridiculous, like ri incredibly ridiculous. Like, uh, I, I don't know. Like, imagine having all these pictures on your phone of yourself crying, like legitimately going through such a tough moment. Usually you don't take pictures of yourself anyway when you're going through tough times, right? It's like when you when you get a bit of, when you get a bit of timber on you, when you're a bit of fat, you don't really have that many selfies of yourself because you clearly know you don't look your greatest, right? So you're, you're a bit self-conscious. So imagine being, imagine being so self-conscious that you know you still look pretty because again there's a part of it that must think wow i still look kind of buff here because she clearly looks fucking hot still do you know what I mean? <laughs> really sad so it's like it's so weird man i just find it insanely weird i really do i just don't know what to say i find it i don't know again it's just me maybe it's just me but i find it fucking like you know the way these wristbands are written i don't know man i just find it strange i just find it strange maybe i get i'm being too crass and shit but i just find it very 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 odd Next on the list in terms of fashion stuff, we have news courtesy of Vogue. Big news, actually. Breaking news and news that's kind of shocked the entire fashion world, it seems like, from what I've been reading on the Twitter space. Daniel Lee has left Bottega Veneta. And if you're wondering who Daniel Lee is, Daniel Lee is basically the guy responsible for bringing Bottega, Bottega, Bottega Veneta back into the public consciousness um, with his Bottega green um, color codes, with his pouch, with those big lugger boots that everyone's kind of a fan of. You know, people from Skepta to Dua Lipa and whatnot are basically wearing that shit head to toe all the time. You know, very many influencers are posting pictures of themselves carrying massive green shopping bags when they leave the store. There seems to be a real prevalence of kind of, I would say, pandering to black people in fashion it feels like, even though Daniel Lee is, you know, whiter than white, maybe he's got a black boyfriend, I don't know where watch way swings don't come at me but it just seems a bit strange anyway in general that whole like you know but you know it, it worked for him because he got the cool points you know lined off the right people he went to detroit did a show over there got card crate to score it and shit you know whatever i think that's mary j blige sitting in the front row in this picture as well isn't it that's mary j blige so yeah he did damn thing but anyway he's now leaving after only three years at particular Vanessa, he's now leaving so this is the this is obviously the from the last clip she did over there at detroit people are people are basically saying maybe he spent too much money and they don't want to keep backing his kind of you know um crazy dreams but let's continue with the article it says Patek Veneta and Daniel Lee have announced that they are parting ways. Lee showed his first collection for the Right Italian Railway show in fall 2019. Um, Leo Rongon, CEO of Patek Veneta, said in a statement, I would like to thank Daniel for his dedication. He provided the Veneta with a fresh perspective and new sense of modernity while remaining respectful of the brand's 50-year heritage. The remarkable growth of the brand over the last three years bears testimony to the success of his creative work. Patek Veneta's 
was Lee's first creative director assignment. He was plucked from Celine Studio, where he was women's wear director under Phoebe Philo, which of course you know, you know the vibes when it comes to Phoebe. Lee's first Roman collection received mixed reviews in part because his particular aesthetic was rough around the edges than the one he helped hone at Celine, but his accessories hit almost instantly. The butter leather pouch sparked a trend for softly constructed leather bags and these square toe pumps and sandals have similar agenda set in effect in the footwear and um, thereafter he has embraced the fashion why did they mention the lug boots so they mentioned the battery levers maybe because they're women's right they're not they're not men's but that's strange that they mentioned the pouch they mentioned um the square toed pumps that all the flipping um instagram hotties were wearing for a period the sandals but they don't mention anything about the fucking lug boots strange isn't it? or the tie whatever they're called anyway continues Thereafter, he was embraced by the fashion establishment at the 2019 Fashion Awards held in London. In December of that year, Lee was nominated for the top four prizes and won them all. Rihanna and Hayley Bieber were both seen in his statement making fringe shirling outwear for that label. The pandemic slowed Lee's role, as it did with the entire fashion industry, with the traditional runway show in rotation system in question. Um, but yeah, he still did that show in fucking Bergheim during the lockdown, and that was fucking, that was a mad thing. And I remember, he flew people out to Germany to do a fucking private after party. What did he do there? That was a mad move, man. <laughs> oh, God. What a legend. London was his first and not long after show. Not long after that show, the brand deleted his social media accounts. Um, a second salon in Berlin was showcased for his brand's experimental network celebrates and flair of colour. But an after party attended by the unmarked and veterinary revelers attracted negative press. Last month, Lee and his team showed his spring lineup at label at the Michigan Theatre in Detroit. The collection was a pivot to a sporty and more casual sensibility. In the state same in the same statement, Lee said, My time at Berlin has partaken of it has been an incredible experience. I'm grateful to have worked in an exceptional talented team and I'm forever thankful for everyone. One who's been part of creating our vision. Thank you for Francois Henri Pinot, Pinot, Pinot. How you pronounce that? Francois Henri. How you pronounce that? How you say Francois Henri Pinot? Is that how you pronounce his name? I think so. For his support and for the opportunity to part of the particular story, the release has said. Um, the release said that a new direction, creative direction for the house, will be announced very soon. So we don't know what the new direction will be, but we can kind of pontificate about why he might have left. Let's say this. It's most likely, most likely when it comes to these sort of cases that he either left because some sort of, you know, misconduct, whatever, behind the scenes, which it probably would have leaked by now, maybe demanding more money or some sort of disagreement with the board, right? Those are probably the two, I think, options that are on the board. And then, of course, there's the fourth and final option, which might tell you that sometimes designers are clever and they try and get out at the top right right when they're at the peak of their powers so that they can kind of leverage all that kind of success that they've had at a previous label into another job because the last thing you want to do because you're only as good as your last collection and i personally thought that last collection in detroit was pretty shit right i thought they weren't that great so if that's the case and he knew the reception to that wasn't the best and that he wasn't maybe getting any better than that um maybe the right thing to do is to sort of you know basically say you're going to quit and in hope that you can kind of leverage that earlier sort of rub to get you a better job whenever you want that going forward. That might be the best way to kind of go about things. I think so, personally, if that was me. Um, I think that might be a great, great option to go, avenue to go down in that respect. But maybe I'm completely wrong. Um, but I do think if you look back some of these earlier collections, right? Um, the first was this in it, 2019 runway, that one there. That's what that's the one I remember kind of finding out who you know Daniel Lee was and what he was kind of basically trying to present on the runway. Um, and it kind of went back to switched it. But if you look at the collections from the beginning to the end, it kind of similar sort of trajectory. It feels like to the Demna at Vetmar. Oh, no, Demna at Vetmar ended quite strong actually. But let's say it didn't. It, that, it started to get quite repetitive very quickly, even though it was a short period of time, because he still did a lot of collections, man. Like, this is... Again, the, the other part of it, too, could be that fashion is fucking brutal, right? So, from what I remember, I think he started designing from here, because obviously, you see, the aesthetic is basically similar. So, in three years, right, he did... The, see the collections? This is how much, you know, fashion is a fucking torturous fucking business, right? From pre two, from pre four, 2019, he did one two three four five oh my god why does it keep clicking and clicking you fucking piece of shit but it looks like he did more than 10 in three years 10 collections which is fucking nuts to think about that that way right but let's look at it properly um pre fall 2019 um so yeah it's like one 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven collections in three years, which is what four collections a year or some shit like that. That is fucking nuts, right? Turning that around, and in that period, he managed to, you know, um, completely change the reception or the kind of a law the appeal of Bottega Veneto he created some monumental pieces that are going to go down in people's fashion archives they're going to become instantly instantly collectible now especially since he's basically good so he's going to leave but it's absolutely crazy to think man 11 collections in three years it's fucking insane so maybe a part of him just thought you know what I'm done man I can't do this anymore um it's a lot of work um especially when it's not your own brand and you just basically a, a kind of a, a hired gun there's also a part of me that thinks maybe he tried to renegotiate his contract because obviously it's free. It's a three-year deal. Was it a three-year deal? Maybe it's a three-year deal. I think it's a three-year deal. I'm not too sure how long the original contract was, but he tried to maybe renegotiate and try to basically use his success of bringing the label away maybe now and try to leverage that into getting a higher salary. They obviously scoffed at that and said, now we don't need you because essentially what these brands do when they have somebody who's that successful, similar to what Saint Laurent did with um, Heidi Slimain, you can sometimes use the after the kind of momentum or whatever kind of steam that designer that creative director has kind of built during the time at your house to basically survive for another two to three years mm, two three years. maybe for another two season no no it's not too soon yeah for another two years let's say let's say another two years you can use that momentum and then in that moment in that time you hope someone can come along who could then kind of carry on your work or carry on that work or maybe lead it in another direction but you can still use that to kind of ensure that the sale numbers are not too drastically different to the ones prior that's what you could do so maybe in particular in this case they were like you know what even though your codes are very, you know, definitive and very much a Daniel Lee thing, there is an option to find a designer who can possibly do what he did to some certain extent um, without maybe having to pay them what he was basically re requiring them to pay him, especially when he kept doing more lavish shows and flying them around in different places. There's a pop-up shop that just opened recently in London, which I'm wondering if that's going to end up getting closed. I'm also wondering if they're going to limit the amount of black people that go on their fashion shows and have to get another creative director in. Who absolutely knows? Who knows? But that first collection, this first one was an absolute barnstormer, mate. If you remember this one. That, that was the first one I kind of remembered who he actually was and um, again the rough around the ages thing was true I think in just terms of an overall first collection I think it started to get a little more tighter as it kind of went down as it went over as it kind of progressed or kind of evolved throughout the years but I did think in terms of providing an an actual first introduction into the fashion sphere and announcing yourself this was kind of you know they smashed it out of the park like, this look free is just fucking you know, this is fucking top level, top tier shit. And already, you know what I mean? Already kind of telling you what he's going to be about. The boots, the patterns on the jackets, the little emblems, the little triangles and shit. Some really, really clever, clever pieces. Even just the, that, I think it's a ribbing on a sweater, isn't it, right? Got this kind of gold chain link thing going on. Like All this stuff is going to become incredibly covetable, incredibly collectible now that he's decided to kind of go in a different direction right again just classic amazing stuff like that this is this is crazily good man look five here is it look five no look 10 sorry from four to 20 four 2019 collection really good and off the back of that i saw this kind of cool article courtesy of um fashionista um that was written in 2017 that says hey quick question what's with creative directors quitting after three years we basically analyze a bunch of creative directors who left their posts after three years too so maybe that's the magic number um it's funny to see uh, as on the way running down the runway there all giggly and stuff we're never going to see that again are we after his accusations of spiking people's drink with ketamine and shit right allegedly that's what i've heard you know, he's probably never going to see him jogging down the flipping runway like that ever ever again um but yeah they continue stefano palati stefano palati i think he's still doing what's his brand now is it randomness or random house what it was called but um yeah he's still doing his thing there raf is obviously raf and hedy semaine you know he's doing hedy semaine shit at celine so it says here quickly read this article it says in recent news sorry in recent fashion news the most surprising yet frequent announcement has been regarding creative directors stepping down from their top roles of fashion houses let's revisit them in chronological order shall we um raf simon leaves dior in october 2015 alexander wang leaves balenciaga in october 2015 
the Balenciaga of Vines and the Wine Balenciaga of them are completely different things, isn't it? Mad to think, man. There was a time when people were really coveting the Alexander Wine Balenciaga. Um, Stefano Paletti at uh, Meglio Zegna, um, Bernard Moulin at Bur Burani, him and Simone leave Serena April 2016. Um, again, they probably have never recovered from that period. I don't think they've sustained their business. Don't think, don't get me wrong, but that's how do you say main Saint Laurent era, man? Just the Wyatt boots alone. Do you know what I mean the guy fucking smashed it? The leather jackets, the jeans, the the flannel shirts, the t shirts. Like, come on, man. The belts, like, just phew, another level. Um, Alessandra Facin Facinietti leaves Todd's in May 2016. Daniel, Daniel Sherman leaves Edun in May 2016. Uh, all these other people we don't really care about. Anyway, it says, what these nine designs have in common is that they each served for just three years before exiting their respective brands, something that doesn't exactly seem coincidental. So we ask the numer numerologist Felicia Bender from Colorado to fill us in on this number. As it turns out, the number three has very pretty and interesting vibrations in numerological, in num numerologically speak, especially with reevaluating one's purpose in life. It's all about self-expression and emotional sensitivity says bender this <laughs> bender this number brings with it an amazing amount of creative energy joy and optimism she also notes there are free as a number of excellence so it's interesting to find these designers choosing to work with these brands for this length of time and then reassessing their decisions um you are being pulled into a change and really tapping into a highest creativity when people are experiencing experiencing this they're also more into moving forward rather than staying in place they have it the number the, the blah, 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 blah. anyway you get it right the point of this, the story is is that most likely this guy's got some hips in a minute the point of the story is that more likely than not in fashion if you're really successful and you do great work and you're selling a lot of clothes and you're making your fashion overlord guys in the suits a lot of money they're going to demand more of you. They're going to demand more of the same. They want to see you replicate that success, double it, triple it, quadruple it, right? That's what they want. They just want to see those numbers increase. They don't care about steady numbers or, you know, breaking even and shit. No, if you're successful one year, you got to double that the next year. So it's kind of a bit of a poison chalice, right? Um, essentially, right? You've kind of made a rod for your own back by the success that you basically do. And nowadays with fucking resort collections and all this sort of shit and pre-fall and all that sort of nonsense, most brands if you're successful the making a pre fall collection and whatnot is just an easy gimme because you've got the resources and the manufacturing to do so anyway so why not try and make yourself some extra money on top of it but then of course like i said daniel lee from what i see has been from his time at Bottega Veneta in that three year period had to design 11 collections right I don't know how many pre collections or resort collections are in there but there's a lot in there so he was demanded to keep you know he made the greatest hits he made some hit items and then he went to make more hit items more colors more shapes more silhouettes boom 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 and i can imagine that could become a little bit more a little bit overwhelming so a lot of these people i'd assume probably felt some of that and thought you know what before i get pushed i'm gonna leave some of them probably just thought as well three years is a good time to kind of gauge or give you an idea kind of to build up a, maybe an archive or a real sort of library or real kind of portfolio of what you're about at that specific brand at a specific time in your life with those specific resources or codes or whatnot yeah that's going forward you use it to obviously go there and also maybe when you sign in year one and they take a punt on you the brands are definitely going to be reluctant to sign you again into more years because they know how kind of um fleeting and fickle the fashion industry is just because you're hot now doesn't mean you're going to be hot later on there's always a possibility that daniel lee could fall out of favor and i did see a real change in the discourse around daniel lee um on social media myself with some of the people that i follow it within the last year or so so maybe he, the brand but take had you know monitored had kind of hired a flipping social media monitoring sort of team who basically came to the same conclusion as well like maybe daniel lee's kind of favor is dropping and all this i don't know many many things that go into it but regardless it's a real big blow i wonder if it's going to change anything when it comes to the brand will we see less black people on the runway um will they stop doing that fucking stupid online magazine thing that just is a magazine um the non-social media use would that be a thing going forward all these weird retail stores popping up pop-up shops retail pop-up shops popping up will that be a thing they stop doing will they change the bags i don't know loads of things i'm interested to see going forward but again daniel lee's out daniel lee's out at protega veneta tell your friends tell your enemies tell everybody ba, 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 ba. what's we gonna talk about here 
we've got a lot to get through in it here a lot to get through um let's get through this one quickly we'll talk about this this is courtesy of TechCrunch. youtube is removing the dislike count on all videos across its platforms boo 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 um they're gonna tell you they're doing this because they want to protect small creators like myself but it's not it's to protect the big corporations that the big brands who don't like it when customers um, potential customers potential viewers decide that they want to inform them that they don't like what they're currently making that's basically it that's it they tell them they don't like what they're doing at the moment they tell them they're not vibing with it right and then they yeah they basically vibe, tell them right voting with their flipping dislike button that they don't like what they're presenting and these brands and corporations don't like it so now they're basically going to these platforms because they're the ones that provide most of the advertising dollars to them in their first place, which basically are the reasons why a lot of these brands are able to stay afloat. They didn't kind of bend to their every single need. And now they're doing all these things that are going to, again, not not really solve anything. Because if anything, this is going to just lead to more people leaving negative comments about certain things and then using the upvotes on the comments to basically tell people that this video has been disliked very heavily. That's basically going to be the thing. Or we're going to see very low numbers of likes on videos, not correlating to the amount of views. So that's also going to be obvious that somebody's not liking everything. And again, the irony of YouTube deciding to remove the dislike button or the dislike count from YouTube, but doing nothing to address bots or fake views and shit. Nothing. So to remove the dislike count, but then people making accounts and, you know, getting fake views on it to leverage them to get new brand opportunities. Like, you know, people like, you know, have been reported, um, Coffee Zilla reported on the Ace Family, right? Um, the Ace Family is supposedly, the, they're like a family vlogging channel and they've basically been uncovered that they use a particular service or boutique thing, whatever, that it basically was used to monitor their social media activity, respond to hateful comments, hide certain things, and obviously inflate their YouTube numbers, which then led them to get other brand deals. So things that are basically co costing YouTube millions, basically from lost kind of earnings or whatnot, they're not wanting to address, but let's get rid of the dislike count because it upset Disney or Marvel or dc or paramount or warner brothers and shit so like, come on man bullshit so let's read the article it says youtube today announced that its decision to make the dislike count on videos private across this platform the decision is likely to be controversial given the extent that impacts on global visibility into a video's reception but youtube believes that the change will better protect its creators from harassment and reduce the threat of what it calls dislike attacks essentially when a group of teams drive up the numbers of dislikes and the video receives that's not really a thing though most people that use the dislike button use it to basically um illustrate or to basically vocalize their disliking of a particular video i have many videos on my channel that have massive amounts of dislikes um vis-a-vis -vis their likes it doesn't impact what the content i put out because i know some of the videos i put out might be controversial they might not be the most popular sort of opinion they might just not be the opinion that's shared by most people which is completely fine so if they vote with their feet or vote with their clicks by not viewing the video so it's got a low view count and they may be having crazy amounts of dislikes that let lets you know that most people that are watching a video don't agree with what you say cool but it doesn't mean it doesn't really mean anything right because it could mean what it could mean that it can it could mean that you might have to change the way you think and revise how you view things that could be one thing or it could just mean that people other people have a differing opinion to you about other things about the same thing they're talking about it could just be that it's completely fine but these corporations want to control everything about how things are perceived and how they're written about but in the only actuality it doesn't make any difference because if your movie sucks we're still not going to watch it anyway the box office numbers are still going to say what they're going to say um people are still not going to buy the toys or you know, you know talk about it much on social media with any kind of glowing sort of terms that like it's not going to make any difference and now especially with sites like rotten tomato because the because the sort of registered or the kind of authentic, not authentic, because the kind of authorized views or whatnot, right? The ones that they want, the you meant to trust are so compromised. Now those views for people to actually go to movies that use those generated views are the ones that people actually kind of pin their hat on because those are from actual real people who don't have ideologically based, um, info, no, they don't have, uh, their tastes aren't, informed by the ideology right those people actually go to watch these movies so those opinions so when, when you see screenshots of people uploading a dave Chappelle special and saying oh don't listen to the actual you know the actual reviewers look at the actual audience members because that's a fair reflection on what the quality of the item is actually going to be like on the product or service whatever it may be but anyway continue 
Since so the company says that while the dislike counts won't be visible to the public, it's not removing the dislike button itself. Users can still click the thumbs down button on videos to signal a dislike for creators privately. Meanwhile, creators will be able to track the dislikes on YouTube Studio alongside the analytics about a video's performance if they choose. So if they want to see it, they can. If they don't want to see it, they don't want to see it. But you won't see the numbers of dislikes. It'll just be the button will still be there. So it's just pathetic. It doesn't make any difference, really. The change follows an experiment YouTube ran earlier this year, whose goal was to determine the source of changes that reduce the dislike and creators' harassment at the time YouTube explained the public dislike counts can affect creators well-being and may motivate targeted campaigns to add dislikes to videos while there's true dislikes can also serve as a signal to others if videos are clickbait spam or misleading which can be useful of course but let's get rid of it anyway um, YouTube said it's also heard that smaller creators than others who were just getting started on the platform that they feel that they were being unfairly targeted that's so not true man what small creator gets targeted by a whole group of people that don't want to like their video honestly the things that they make up of people is just bullshit. The experiment confirmed that it was true. Creators with small channels were targeted with dislike attacks more than regular. YouTube declined to share the specific details exactly. Got to through these experiments with TechCrunch asks. However, but it said they ran the test on multiple months and concluded it in different analysis. So that's just going to look like. You're still going to see the upvotes, but you're just not going to see the, the numbers of dust likes on there. Again, pretty pathetic. Mostly protected big corporations who are essentially running YouTube just have to look at the trending pages to see the amount of control that they have editorially on that site. It's not, it's never, it, it was, it, for a small time, YouTube was the home of small creators, right? They did kind of, you know, like the fact that people could go from where I am, 11,000 or so subs to 100,000 to, to a million or whatnot. They did like that. But now it's got to a point where they don't really care. Um, you know, they get these big brands come in, set up their channels on them. They probably give them managers and shit to kind of, you know, set things up and work in collaboration with them and all that sort of good stuff. And that's where the real big up bucks comes in. So it makes sense that they're going to kind of bow to the feet of the people that are actually paying their wages. But it's just a bit frustrating to see as again, as a long time, long time YouTube creator and user to see them basically acquiesce into all the demands of the corporation but doing absolutely nothing to change the experience for small medium and large creators who are on this platform who basically form the bedrock of the platform in general but you know you, what can you what can you expect from these people not much in it not much uh anyway that's actually a thing show i think 516 I don't want to take too much more of your time there. I'm already an hour and 20 minutes in. So we're going to leave the show right there. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're watching, listening via the podcast app, five star review, please. If you don't mind, that'd be greatly appreciated. And, you know, check out the Patreon later on for an in-depth account on all my X-rayed activities. For now, though, take care. Be safe. Peace. <laughs>